In this Expeditions in Geology video, we'll follow the Mississippi River from its headwaters in Minnesota, through the central U.S., and all the way to its mouth at the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River is the longest river in the United States if you go by the lengths of the rivers as they're officially named. But an argument is sometimes made that a tributary of the Mississippi, the Missouri River, is actually a little longer. Regardless of whether it's first or second, the Mississippi is a little over 3,700 kilometers long. That's just over 2,300 miles. The combination of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers is sometimes called the Mississippi-Missouri River System, which is the longest in North America and the fourth longest in the world. The Mississippi's drainage basin covers nearly three million square kilometers of North America, or about one-eighth of the entire continent. That includes all or part of 31 U.S. states and parts of two Canadian provinces. How wide is the Mississippi? It turns out its narrowest and normally its widest part are both in Minnesota. It's narrowest as it begins its journey in northern Minnesota and widest where the river's water passes through 11 kilometer wide Lake Winnebagoshish. At the other end of the river, it discharges over a cubic kilometer of water into the Gulf of Mexico every 16 to 17 hours. The name Mississippi is derived from an Ojibwe word meaning big or great river. The Mississippi River starts out 450 meters above sea level in northern Minnesota. While it might seem as if the origin of such a mighty river would be obvious, it's a lot more arbitrary than you might imagine. Explorers in the 1800s competed to find the true source of the river. I'm standing in a tiny creek in northern Minnesota that flows northward out of a medium-sized lake over that way about 100 meters. The name of this tiny creek is the Mississippi River, and this is where it begins its 2,318-mile journey to the Gulf of Mexico. In 1832, explorer Henry Schoolcraft discovered this spot, and no doubt because the exact source of a major river like the Mississippi is not always so clear-cut, he gave the lake here a special name. We can speculate that the name he gave that lake was intended to help ensure that his discovery and this spot would become recognized as the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And what was the name he gave the lake from which the Mississippi flows? Well, what he actually did was to take parts of two words and combine them. In Latin, veritas means true and caput means head. He took the last part of veritas and the first part of caput and got Lake Itasca. A drop of water leaving Lake Itasca takes about 90 days to reach the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River flows north initially and then east and finally south toward the Gulf of Mexico. It's a gentle descent through Minnesota flowing mostly over glacial deposits laid down by continental glaciers. There's rarely a riffle in the river except in a few special places such as Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and the only waterfall on the river is St. Anthony Falls in Minneapolis. But for the most part, the Mississippi flows quietly through the forests and farmlands of the upper Midwest in or along the borders of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois. For hundreds of years, the Mississippi River has served as a passageway for ships, barges, goods, and people. But it's not an unfettered highway. South of St. Louis, the river is large and drops less than 75 meters in over 1,500 kilometers. But between St. Louis and Minneapolis-St. Paul, the river has been transformed into kind of a staircase. There are 29 dams, each outfitted with a lock to allow easy navigation by ships and barges, all the way from the Gulf to Minneapolis-St. Paul, near the very center of the continent. A lock is a kind of water-based, two-doored elevator between two levels of a river. Both ships or barges can enter from upstream and as the water is drained out, the downstream gate is opened, allowing them to sail out onto a lower elevation part of the river. Or they can enter from the downstream side, and when the door is closed behind them and the lock is filled with water, the vessel is floated up to the level of the upstream, higher elevation, part of the river. As the Mississippi River begins its journey, it's little more than a creek, gently meandering across the glacial drift covering most of Minnesota. It grows into a major river as it flows south, as it adds the water from the Missouri, Ohio, Illinois, and Arkansas rivers. 
As its gradient decreases and its floodplain widens to 15 kilometers or more in places, meanders help create a maze of channels and abandoned channels. A meandering pattern is a normal thing for rivers flowing gently across relatively homogeneous sediments. Meanders can be initiated by virtually any obstruction or heterogeneity in the materials the river flows across. Virtually anything can start a river meandering. Flowing water has momentum and so it strikes the outside of gentle curves in the channel, causing erosion and creating what's called a cut bank. It deflects off that bank and the process repeats. While it carves the outsides of bends in the river, the insides of the bends tend to be shallow, and here the river deposits sand and or gravel, creating what are known as point bars. Meanders don't change rapidly by human standards, but they do change slowly over time. They can extend, they can translate, they can rotate, and they can change from a simple meander to what's called a compound meander. They can also become more extreme until the river cuts through the narrow part of the meander, and this is called a meander cutoff, or more specifically, a neck cutoff. By cutting off a meander, a river shortens its channel and increases its gradient. It also creates an oxbow lake, a relatively short-lived lake prone to filling up over time with sediment and organic material. As rivers approach their terminations, it's natural that they seek the shortest path to their destination. The Mississippi has basically followed its current route to the Gulf for approximately 750 years, and it's overdue to find a new course. An alternative route already exists in southern Louisiana in the form of the Atchafalaya River. At present, this river already steals a third of the Mississippi's water on a shortcut to the Gulf, a route some 320 kilometers shorter than the existing channel. The old river control structure is designed to keep the Mississippi in its current channel, allowing only 30% of its water to divert into the Atchafalaya. But in 1973, a large flood almost shifted the Mississippi's water over to the Atchafalaya River. If this happens, and it may be only a matter of time until it does, it will have a catastrophic economic impact on Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and the entire region. The Mississippi River ends by emptying an average of around 13,000 cubic meters of water into the Gulf of Mexico each second, where it has created a classic delta. Deltas are dynamic features that evolve over hundreds or thousands of years. Where the muddy waters of the Mississippi empty into the Gulf, a sediment plume is easily visible. Despite the addition of some 200 million tons of sediment each year, the delta is, at present, literally losing ground. About 50 acres of land are lost to the sea each day, making places like New Orleans all the more vulnerable in the future. This loss could be slowed, and discussions about how this could be accomplished will no doubt become more urgent in the future.